So chapter three is really going to focus on the language of analytical chemistry and start giving you some mathematical definitions for how you make measurements in the lab. So we'll start with a few definitions. The first is analyte. This is the component of the sample that you're interested in finding out about. The analysis then is the process that's going to provide the chemical or physical information about the constituents in the sample or of the sample itself. A determination is an analysis of a sample to find the identity, the concentration, or other properties of the analyte. And a specific measurement is the experimental determination of the analyte's chemical or physical properties. So these all seem a little bit similar, but they're on kind of this hierarchical pyramid where the analysis is the base of the pyramid that you use to make a determination and then that becomes a measurement that you can then use. So here's an example of using this type of terminology. You might collect and analyze water samples to determine the concentration of E. coli in the water sample. And a specific measurement then is going to be used to evaluate that water safety. Few more uh, definitions here. So first we have a technique. This is any chemical or physical principle that can be used to study an analyte. We'll see we have lots of techniques and lots of different equipment around in the lab that we can use. And to do that, we then have to develop a method. This is the application of a technique for a specific determination of a specific analyte in a specific matrix. So we'll talk a lot about matrices this term as well. And the matrix is kind of the surrounding stuff or goo that your analyte is in. So if you have like a soil sample, that's a very complex mixture that has a specific feature about it. And that's what's known as the matrix. So a procedure then is going to be the set of written directions detailing how to apply a method to a particular sample, including information on proper sampling, handling of interference if they are present inside your matrix, and for validating the results. The protocol then is kind of the top of the pyramid. This is a set of stringent guidelines detailing a procedure that has to be followed if an agency that has adopted the protocol is to accept the results. So um, an agency like the EPA would come up with their set of protocols that they would use in the analysis of say lead in drinking water. So this is also hierarchical where the technique is the base of the pyramid, methods can be developed from that into a procedure. And if the procedure is robust enough, it can be adopted by an agency that develops a very detailed protocol for measuring an analyte. All right, so you can see a development scheme here in this case, the technique is the graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy. And we want to look at the concentration of lead either in water, soil, or in blood. For the water sample, we can see that there are procedures that have been developed by the American Society for Testing and Materials, the ASTM, or the American Public Health Association, the APHA. And these procedures that they developed were then adopted by the EPA and developed into stringent protocols that the EPA will require any laboratory to use if they're gonna measure lead concentrations in water that will be used for assessment by the EPA. Okay, so when you're designing procedures, this requires actually quite a lot, right? It's gonna require identifying the problem. What do you want to analyze? using tools and techniques to select the appropriate methods for the analysis. And then we're gonna have to establish a lot of these design criteria. And we're gonna talk about these different components in more detail, things like accuracy and precision, the scale of your operation, how much sample do you start with, the sensitivity and selectivity of your methods that you're using, how much does it cost and how fast is it? 
You also have to identify any interference that might be in the sample. Like, is there another, is there another compound in your mixture that also reacts in your technique? Is that going to make it seem like there's too much of your analyte in there when it's not really that much? Or maybe it's going to block the signal of your analyte and you'll get too little of your analyte when you really have more in there. So you need to identify whether you have other things in the, the sample matrix. You need to select a suitable method, and then you have to establish validation criteria and a sampling strategy. How do you take the samples from wherever they're coming from? So if it's an environmental sample, how do you go about selecting sample sets that are gonna be representative of that mixture? Right, like if you're sampling from a lake, where do you choose to, to make those uh, samplings? So we'll talk about sampling strategy later in term, but um, this chapter is gonna focus up here. And then later on, we'll get into more identification of interference and how we deal with those. So there's two major types of analytical techniques that we use. There's techniques that measure the absolute amount of the analyte, and these are called absolute techniques. And there's uh, samples or techniques that use, that will be proportional to the relative amount of the analyte, and these are called relative techniques. So both are very useful. Um, and what exactly does this mean? So let's take an example here, where we have two graduated cylinders that contain a solution of copper nitrate that is at the same concentration, 0 0.10 molar copper nitrate. But in the one over here, we only have 10 milliliters of the solution. And over here, we have 20 milliliters of the solution. So the solution on the left only contains 1.0 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of copper 2, whereas the cylinder on the right contains 2 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. Right, It's got double the amount of copper in that solution. So the absolute amounts are going to differ. So if we're gonna measure using a technique that would be an absolute technique, we would have some signal of the analyte. So that big S is the signal that is coming from whatever our technique is that we're using to measure this. That A is the analyte that we're interested in measuring. In this case, that's the copper two, right? And that's gonna be related to the moles of the copper that are present, right? So this is moles of the analyte, or it could be grams, but it's the absolute amount that's present there. It depends just how you're measuring it. And then you've got a constant. So this is Ka is the proportionality constant that relates the moles to your signal, whatever you're using to measure that. So in this case, our absolute technique is going to show us that we have twice as many moles of copper in cylinder two on the right side than cylinder one um, because we, we have twice as much of the sample in there. So relative technique on, on the other hand is going to use a technique that responds to the analyte's concentration. So our equation is very similar we still have the signal of the analyte, right? But now the signal is gonna be proportional to the concentration. So C is concentration, right, of the analyte. And we still have a proportionality constant here. All right, so since both of our cylinders in this case have the same concentration of copper, their analysis is gonna yield the identical um, signal, right? Because the concentrations in these two solutions is the same. So if we're doing total analysis techniques, it's common to see mass and volume as the signals uh, for the total analysis. And techniques that would uh, measure mass and volume are gravimetry and titrimetry, We'll do some titrometric experiments later this term. So this would be a total analysis technique. So with few exceptions, the signal for the total analysis is a result of one or more chemical reactions. 
And so the stoichiometry of that reaction determines the value of Ka. So this constant can be calculated based on the stoichiometry, and it's going to be the same whether you do uh, the reaction at Wu or at OSU or at any other location. Okay, but when you have a concentration technique, um, the relationship between the signal and the analyte's concentration is a, the is a theoretical function, and it depends on the experimental conditions and the instrument used to measure the signal. So even though our equation is very similar, the nature of that proportionality constant can vary. So in this case, Ka has to be determined experimentally whenever you're doing the reaction, right? So you need to determine this at the location that you're doing the reaction and with the instrumentation, all right? So spectroscopy and electrochemistry are two types of techniques that will deal more with concentrations. We use spectroscopy quite a lot in the lab and we'll be doing some experiments with this. Um, and so if you're using say a UV spectrophotometer, if you are using one over here in the lab and somebody else is using a different one over here, each of those people are going to have to calculate the Ka for their reaction because it can vary based on the instrument that you're using or the time that you're doing the reaction uh, and I don't know, the heat in the room, all different kinds of things can uh, cause concentration techniques that Ka to vary. So you have to determine that experimentally when you're running the experiment using a set of standards. So you need standards to do this. Right, and then once you've evaluated the standard, you can calculate the Ka, and then you can have an unknown in here. And when you read the signal of the unknown, you'll be able to calculate the concentration. 